But look, the Fed is repeating a lot of these same mistakes. Their number one goal should be to tackle inflation. Leave everything else out of it. Tackle inflation. Cut the balance sheet to about 6% of GDP, which would be around $1.75 trillion instead of the $7 trillion today. And that would bring the balance sheet closer to the pre-2008 crisis levels, providing a more stable foundation for economic growth. Hello. Welcome to this week's economy. I'm your host, Dr. Vance Ginn. I hope you're having a prosperous day. Well, today I'm delighted to come with you again to talk about one of the key issues that are going on that are facing us each and every day. I hope that you've enjoyed this each week as I continue to bring this week's economy. And don't miss out on the Let People Prosper show with some great guests. And I have a great, uh, some great guests coming up as well that you don't want to miss out on. Um, so be sure to check that out as well. Remember, you can get a lot of the good information at Vance Vancegain.com and Vancegain.substack.com. But with all that behind us, let's jump right into it, all right? Number one, Trump's cabinet. In the news, with former President Trump now confirmed as the election winner to become the 45th and now the 47th president, he's starting to build his cabinet. One of the most notable announcements is the creation of a new Department of Government Efficiency named Doge, or Doji, I don't know how to pronounce it necessarily, but Doge, let's call it that, which Elon Musk and Vivek Ravek Ramaswamy will lead. Um, so look, my take on this is time for action. Reining in federal spending and federal regulations has to be priority number one. And it's not just reining them in, but actually cutting them. And so any way we can do that, we should be pushing forward to do that. Congress, whether it's Republicans or Democrats, cannot seem to get their act together. So maybe what we need instead is something like the Doge, which is an outside of government organization, or not organization, but group that's going to come together. It looks like they're going to provide more insights um, and opportunities for the public to get involved. I will be doing my part to submit as much as I can to get them to cut government spending. Because remember, we're running $2 trillion a year plus in, in deficits. That's just unsustainable. We've got to do something about this before it takes more of our resources, more of our economy, and more of our prosperity away from us because of excessive government spending. And if also, at the same time, they find ways to cut regulations, we're talking about economic boom that could happen by unleashing the over the Leviathan of government really uh, across the economy. So I think this is really important. Elon Musk, Vivek Ramaswamy, both have done a good job of at least talking a good, uh, the good points about making sure that this is actually has some teeth and things of that nature. That's one area where I'm a little bit concerned. Uh, but look, it's outside of government. So no taxpayer funds are going to that. So that's I think that's important. Um, what we should also see if there's some sort of teeth, really the teeth that I think will come come from this is, um, you know, let's say they have a number of, t- of cuts to government spending, cuts in regulations. Congress doesn't have to listen to them. Uh, the president can't do very much about a lot of those cuts that are needed. And so what could happen, though, is President Trump, if they can get him, him on board with cutting government spending, he could use the bully pulpit, right, and go through and demand that Congress make these changes or he's going to veto every bill. I mean, he could put a lot of pressure on Congress to make these changes. And Congress is going to be a majority of Republicans in the Senate and Republicans in the House. So they've got a trifecta here. They should make the best out of this opportunity because Americans are going to suffer if they don't. Speaking of suffering, number two, inflation rising. In the news, the latest Consumer Price Index, CPI, report revealed that inflation picked up again in October with the CPI rising by 0.2% across a broad range of goods and services. And even the the headline number for year over year was up about 2.6%. My take on this is that core inflation, when you exclude food and energy, which of course we all buy, is at the highest level since May. The new CPI report shows that this is the third straight month that core CPI inflation is going up and it's now reached 3.3%, well above the 2% average inflation target that the Federal Reserve has put in place, or at least they consider. And this is the highest level of inflation now since May of 2024. This is just not a good situation, okay? Um, And and this is something I've been talking about again and again. The Fed cannot repeat the same mistakes of the past. 
I don't like the idea of Donald Trump trying to influence what Jerome Powell is doing, although they're independent, kind of a name only, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but what I don't want to see is the Federal Reserve making bad decisions. This is ultimately why the Federal Reserve should probably run by a computer, much like most government actually should be run by computers uh, and AI and things of that nature. Get the discretion out of it and leave them to rules, of fiscal rules and monetary rules. We would be in a much better situation with much more liberty and freedom and prosperity along the way. But look, the Fed is repeating a lot of these same mistakes. Their number one goal should be to tackle inflation. Leave everything else out of it. Tackle inflation. Cut the balance sheet to about 6% of GDP, which would be around $1.75 trillion instead of the $7 trillion today. And that would bring the balance sheet closer to the pre-2008 crisis levels, providing a more stable foundation for economic growth. I think that would be huge and allow for more uh, stability in the marketplace with all the, bu- the bubbles that are out there. We can get rid of those. It'd be a much better situation over overall, okay? Um, number three, nuclear energy. In the news, the U.S. is facing growing energy demand driven by industries like AI, electric vehicles, data centers, and more. Last week, the Biden administration unveiled a plan to expand nuclear power over the next few decades. While the plan outlines ambitious goals, it lacks funding and will depend on Congress and the incoming Trump administration to implement. Energy was a key issue in the recent election, especially in swing states like Pennsylvania, where fracking played a central role. My take on this is a key part of America's energy future is going to be nuclear power. I'm one who likes all of the above approach. I just want, don't want the government putting their thumb on the scale when one way or the other, whether it's natural gas or oil or nuclear power, the reliable source of energy or the unreliable source of energy like wind and solar and hydropower and other things. You know, I, I don't like the government picking winners and losers. I want the competition in the marketplace through price signals to indicate what we should be using versus the government coming out and saying what we should be using. They don't know what's best. The marketplace knows what's best. OK, we don't need the top down socialist system. We have that too many places. Otherwise, this is why we're having brownouts and blackouts across the country and running short on electricity is because of government failures, not because of market failures. If you privatize these things, allow for markets to work and and allow for prices to send the best signals to what energy sources we should use, we'll be in a much better situation that we don't have to worry about electricity going out and not having um, cheap and affordable and abundant energy all across the country. So let's make sure we get to that. But I think nuclear power should be a big part of what's going on there. Okay. Next, number four, the Fed under Trump. In the news, Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell was recently asked about his future under the incoming Trump administration. Powell maintained that the U.S. law protects him and other Federal Reserve governors from being removed from office before their term ends. My take on this is that ultimately, what should we do? We should end the Fed. We don't need a central banker. We don't need any of that. We should allow markets to work, a free banking sort of situation, a gold standard, something else that would allow us to not be a fiat monetary system that has a central bank directing assets, directing markets across the economy, setting interest rates and screwing up things in so many ways, if I may be blunt. And so the President Trump, look, Jerome Powell's right. Trump can't come in and fire him. Um, But I think he could put a lot of pressure on him to move out uh, of that position. Um, The Fed is supposed to be an independent body, but it was created by Congress. Okay, in 1913, um, the 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 banks actually pay fees to that fund the Federal Reserve. Um, so it's just an interesting sort of situation. But you also they get a lot of their funding from interest on the government's debt that they buy and put it on their balance sheet. And that's why it's up to seven trillion dollars. Um, and, and so I think the president is right to understand or, or indicate his, his concern with Powell as Fed chairman. I think he's done a pretty poor job overall. Um, left interest rates too low for too long, kept the balance sheet too, too high for too long. And we've got many more issues going on. You know, the Fed, I think the Fed should get a, a new chairman. Whether Jerome Powell decides to leave or not, that's a different question. His term will end May 2026, which is when I think that we should get a new Fed chairman. Um, and, and so if not quicker, okay. Uh, Number five pro-growth policy in Texas. In the news, as the 89th Texas legislative session approaches, law, and that's in January of 2025, okay? January 14th is when it starts. Lawmakers in the Texas House and Senate have filed over a thousand bills already. Among them, Texas State Representative Brian Harrison and others have introduced a series of bold proposals to advance pro-growth and pro-liberty policies. My take on this is, look, we're winning. The, the Republicans in, in the House and Senate actually went more 
more conservative, I would argue, across the board, um, just the big wins across in Texas. So we they need to use um, their ability to pass pro-growth, pro-liberty, pro-liberty policies as much as possible. And one of those people who is doing this every, each and every day, it seems like, is is Brian Harrison uh, at a middle in Texas. Texas. Um, he also served in the House Health and Human Services and the Trump administration as chief of staff. I um, had him on my show, the Let People Prosper show, which you should go check that out as well. But he's got some good bills in there that would abolish pro- property taxes, um, it, getting rid of the Chevron deferences, deference, um, making sure we have free market principles, ending taxpayer-funded lobbying. There are other good bills that are out there too by Senator Mays, uh, Hayes Middleton. Mays Middleton, there we go. And also Briscoe Kane and, and others. I think that this is going to be a good step in the right direction. Even Dustin Burroughs, right? who's a good uh, friend who went to Texas Tech out there in Lubbock. Um, he's even talking about having the Death Star number two, which is a regulations where the local governments can't put too much in regulations. I think we also need some local spending limits, which Briscoe Kane filed. Um, and we need ways to put property taxes on a path to elimination as quickly as possible. And one of those is House Bill 698 by Brian Harrison, which would says, look, in five years, we're going to get rid of property taxes, find a way to do it. And that's what we need is a good path. That's why North Dakota I believe, didn't pass their recent um, uh, amendment to their constitution that basically says to eliminate property taxes because they didn't really have a good, bold path. That's really what they need, okay? Number six, fiscal conservatism in Louisiana. In the news, Louisiana has kicked off a special legislative session aimed at tackling tax and spending reforms with a focus on creating a sustainable uh, fiscal future. Newly elected House leaders are debating various approaches to address the state's high tax burden and spending levels. State officials argue that fiscal reforms are necessary to promote economic growth and reduce Louisiana's reliance on high taxes, which they say have hindered competitiveness compared to neighboring states. This is certainly true. My take is is that we We've got to have fiscal conservatism in Louisiana and really in every state and at the federal level as well. And that focuses on responsible budgeting, low taxes, and expanding economic freedom. This is crucial for Louisiana's comeback and to allow for people to stop wanting to leave the state where there's a net out migration, the only place really in the South that that's happening, and instead have more people stay. When you have that brain drain, when you have so many people moving out of new businesses and everything else, it just reduces the economic growth and the potential for getting out of poverty so much much across the state. And I'm hopeful that they can realize this, but they've got to make sure that they prioritize responsible budgeting. Spending less is going to be key, not only now, but in the future. There's some discussion about putting a spending limit in place. I hope it's as strong as possible based on population growth plus inflation, and then using any surpluses to buy down their income taxes. But there's also talk about flattening the income tax at 3%. They have a progressive system today. Also flattening the corporate income tax rate as well, and even getting rid of their franchise tax. So these are some key pro-growth policies that I hope that they will make and pass these, but they've also got to make sure they have fiscal conservatism because if not, they're going to turn into a Kansas or other states that have done a poor job of cutting taxes and then not reigning in government spending and leading to higher taxes in the future. That's something that they cannot have. And if they embrace spending discipline, Louisiana, like Colorado's Taxpayer Bill of Rights and others that are out there, I think this will be a great opportunity for Louisiana to set the stage for many many things to come. I know my good friends at the Pelican Institute are doing some great work over there and they will continue to do that because this is a great opportunity there in this special session in Louisiana. Well, that's all I've got for you this week. There's been a lot going on. Uh, We're getting close to the Thanksgiving break, one of my favorite times of the year. Um, But thank you for joining me in this week's episode of This Week's Economy. For more insights, don't forget, go to Vanskin.com and don't forget to get a paid subscription to my newsletter, Substack newsletter, Vanskin.substack.com, so you receive this in your inbox every time they come out. Um, I've got a lot more stuff to talk about soon, as you know I always do. Thank you for joining me again, and until next time, let people prosper.